Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Good evening. Thanks for joining us on air and online. I'm Brianna Venosi, in for Mary Alice Williams. The number of New Jersey lives lost to the coronavirus is now five times the number lost on 9-11, with nearly 4,000 fatalities due to COVID-19 complications and another 323 new deaths reported today. That's the fourth day in a row the count was 300 or more. The total number of positive coronavirus cases is now nearing 80,000 statewide. That's with roughly 3,200 new positive tests. The numbers don't give a whole picture because of a roughly five to seven day delay for labs to test samples and report results. But there are signs the rate of infection is slowing. Just over 8,000 patients remain hospitalized, a number that's slowly declined over the week, with nearly 2,000 in critical care and nearly 1,600 more on ventilators. Another number we look to every day, 787 patients discharged from hospitals. Today's snapshot comes on the heels of President Trump's announcement that he'll let governors call the shots for reopening their economies and gradually lifting social distancing restrictions, something Governor Murphy says will require much stronger and more widespread testing procedures, reminding everyone to remain vigilant in social distancing and not get complacent. I take solace and guidance in the words of one of my heroes, Vice President and Senator Hubert Humphrey, and I quote him, the moral test of government is how it treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Those are words to guide us indeed. I want to give my dear friend Lou Stilato a shout out. He and I are co-chairs of the Hubert Humphrey Fan Club in New Jersey, I think. This is a moral test for us all. The last thing we can do is relax and get complacent. The governor says the state still needs all the help it can get, announcing that the attorney general's office will begin issuing temporary emergency licenses to allow foreign credentialed doctors to join New Jersey health care workers in this war against the coronavirus. This as an army task force is being called in to help medical personnel in Newark. Hospitals across the state still looking for ways to alleviate the crushing pressure on staff. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports on reinforcements for the front line. Just a week ago, we were very, very strained, uh, and this has been an absolute lifesaver for us. Dr. Sharif El Nahal is beyond grateful for U.S. Army Reserve reinforcements, 85 doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals who arrived this week at University Hospital where COVID 19 hit hard. Last week, critically ill patients overwhelmed short-staffed, exhausted health care workers here. A task force from the 332nd Medical Brigade arrived Tuesday and got to work Wednesday. So these are folks that are used to being deployed and activated and work quickly. They've done that here. That has been a tremendous help for this hospital, a major morale boost for our staff. We've been in different countries providing medical care you know, all over the world. Uh, but never a situation quite like this. In her regular job, their commander's a social worker for a Florida school district. Major Aaron Velasquez says the COVID-19 hospital landscape with so many deaths, the PPEs and the threat of infection presented the toughest adjustments for her staff. For some, maybe the risk involved, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the loss, you know, being experiencing you know, different loss, you know, that they're having to deal with. But the warm welcome from University Hospital staff moved many, including Velasquez, to tears. One of the nurses, as we came in, said, it feels like Christmas. So... <clears throat> what was so that like? Were... Having someone tell you that? It 
it hits your heart. The task force doesn't know how long they'll be here, but Dr. El Nahal says the hospital's seeing improved patient outcomes with new drugs and treatments. With the uh, U.S. Army here, um, especially augmenting our staff, with us getting better and better at treating these patients as we learn more, introducing these exciting new therapies and clinical trials, there is hope, there's more and more hope every single day. I'm very optimistic and I think hopefully the, the worst is behind us. Dr. Nizar Kafaya says Hudson Regional Hospital's trying new COVID-19 treatments sourced from doctors around the globe. Deaths have plummeted from 24 per day down to one. The number of new patients hooked up to ventilators here is down by half and morale is up as more patients get discharged. Have recovered from COVID-19 and are being sent home to reunite with their families. A lot of focus right now needs to be on figuring out um, if we are going to test everyone else, whether they're symptomatic or not, uh, and check for immunity status so we can get back to our normal life. Healthcare professionals across the state realize that COVID-19 admissions continue, that there could be a second wave of patients, that more testing needs to be done. But now they're celebrating each victory and the gracious assistance of strangers. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. The state's hospital system is in the middle of an unprecedented crisis, responding to demands for critical COVID-19 patients, along with shortages of everything from beds to protective equipment and staff. This while trying to learn more about an unknown virus in real time. How are they grappling with the situation? We asked Kathleen Bennett, president and CEO of the New Jersey Hospital Association. So Kathleen, we learned this week that the predictive models now show this peak might hit around April 25th. Are hospitals ready in terms of PPE beds and staff? It's a really good question and we have been indeed tracking when the peak could hit. And in terms of beds, we've done a great job here in New Jersey. We've increased capacity by more than 60% at this point. Um, in terms of staff, there's definitely been a bit of a challenge just because the staff themselves have been you know, taking ill and um, have had some time away from work, but we've been seeing an uptick and a return there, so that's been good. And PPE continues to be a challenge and it is one we need to address. We are really hopeful that the Defense Protection Act is gonna be put into play and that our, all resources are gonna be brought to bear to keep our healthcare workforce safe. How are you coordinating with hospitals? Because we're hearing about these hospitals going on divert status, not just because of the surge in patients, but because of that staff shortage. What's, what's being done there? So from you know, that perspective, the staff have actually moved from, um, a, you know, from a contingency and into crisis standards of care. That means that you, you start to be a little bit different in terms of how staffing gets approached. So as patients get cohorted, you might start to see specific teams that are assigned to patients that are COVID positive, so that those teams um, are you know, maximizing their use of PPE, and they're also maximizing their use together to serve and care for the patients. Are there incentives to get more people just in the mix? Um, there are different um, options that have been taking place. That includes the volunteer portal that the state has put up. As I think you know, uh, there's approximately uh, 19,000, I believe I heard as a number um, for volunteers that way. We've also seen volunteers come in from other states. Um, hospitals have been working with staffing agencies. And we've also seen the staff at hospitals get really creative in terms of how they team and what they do to reduce exposure and maximize use of PPE. Let's stick on that PPE. There's, you know, this, this decontamination unit, this fatal decontamination <clears throat> unit um, coming. What is that going to do for our hospitals um, by, by enabling some more of this PPE to be reused? We were really grateful to see that New Jersey was the first state selected by the federal government uh, for um, arrival of a Battelle decontamination system. Um, the Battelle, which is going to be set up in Edison, so a central location in the state, once it is fully operational, will be able to decontaminate up to 80,000 N95 respirator masks daily. So what that means is that we'll do a better job of helping to protect our healthcare workforce. Uh, because as you know, those N95s have truly been at a premium. 
What kind of pressure are you hearing from both um, the hospitals and from nurses? I mean, we've had calls from nurses who say, you know, they're being pressured into working without N95 masks, without proper equipment. How are you advising as an association, the hospitals to deal with these situations? Make no mistake about it. All of the hospitals want to ensure that all of their staff is protected and has appropriate PPE. But we as a nation and frankly, globally, are confronting a supply chain issue. And so when you don't have all of the PPE that you would like to have and that you wish you could wrap your work staff up in, then you actually start working through from what has been your best evidence-based, best practice standards of care and into contingency standards and ultimately into crisis standards. Kathleen Bennett, we thank you so much for your time. Stay healthy. Thank you. Governor Murphy announced it will be at least another month before the state's K-12 schools can reopen, and that means the reliance on remote teaching tools will be a prolonged reality. But new research shows New Jersey ranks number one for online attendance during this pandemic, while less than half of students across the country are showing up for remote class. Joanna Gagas checks in with parents to see where the gaps in distance learning remain. No one really understood the true severity of what's going on, so we didn't really know at the time that we might not be going back to school. Emily Cook is a high school senior who says adjusting to homeschooling has been hard. And now that Governor Murphy has closed schools until May 15th, she's worried she'll miss out on the major milestones of her senior year, like prom and graduation. We're just holding on to a little bit of hope that we might be able to see those people again. Yeah. Dawn Vaca is a mom of three elementary oh, aged just, kids who um, sees it very differently. I wish we would just make the call for the year at this point. We have our routine, we have our schedule, and I just, it's so important to be safe. That routine is key as the school closure continues, says Dr. Jamar Mills. Students are used to waking up early, you know, brushing their teeth, hopping in the shower, putting on some clothes and then getting prepared for the day. Um, it's important that families continue to do that because it's going to set the tone for what the expectation is. We do get up early. I try to make sure that she eats. That's something that she wasn't doing before when she was rushing out to school. Davia Brown Franklin's daughter Marley is a sophomore in Teaneck who's on the clock from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And while they have the routine down, she acknowledges that another month of home instruction will have an impact. There will be a lot of catch up for many students. And I think as parents and as school administrators, we're gonna to have to be okay with that because if we don't get the social emotional right right now, we're not gonna be able to get them to dig into the real like educational component of it. The social emotional is a part of the educational component. It's really important. We've lost our my father-in-law during this and having a loss during this time has been, it's just added a whole other level of um, pain for these kids. It's going to be very, very important for them to be in heavy communication with the teacher, not just about the schoolwork, but about their family setup and structure. Those things are going to be vital to the success of this kind of partnership. One idea proposed by Dr. Mills, change next year's school calendar to start in August and eliminate some of those scheduled holidays to help get these students back on track. In Verona, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. To enhance the remote learning, NJTV continues the NJTV Learning Live series, featuring lessons taught by local teachers for grades 3 through 6 every weekday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Visit njtvonline.org learn for more information. There's another growing threat amid this health and economic crisis, scammers looking to make a buck by preying on fears of the virus and the generosity of those trying to help. Senior correspondent David Cruz has the story. The inevitable byproduct of any crisis is the unscrupulous individuals trying to take advantage of it by scamming the most vulnerable. And the current pandemic is no exception. The state's attorney general's office is reporting an increase in scams of individuals and organizations hit hard by the COVID-19 crisis. The state's office of consumer protection says, as always, be wary. Acting director Paul Rodriguez says some of the more popular scams surround the so-called stimulus checks. The important thing for our viewers to know is that the stimulus checks are going to be sent to people automatically. They do not 
people will not be reaching out. They don't have to provide information uh, to the government. And in particular, they do not have to provide information to someone who reaches out to them. So the only people who really have to reach out to the to the government to get a stimulus check are people who have not filed, who did not file their taxes uh, previously in the last couple of years. They can go directly to the IRS site and give them their information. And that's irs.gov. Anything else is very likely a scam. And it's not just someone calling you at home. These can be emails or texts with links to fake websites. Rodriguez says popular scams include the old, I'm a long lost relative and I need money for medical bills, or I'm quarantined and need help with rent or food. Other scams target small businesses offering help on SBA loan applications if you give up your social security number. If someone is trying to pressure you into turning over information or turning over money immediately, that's a huge red flag. Just take a step back, talk to someone you trust, go to a, a trusted uh, information source. Don't just reflexively give her information because you want them to go away. Monmouth County Assemblywoman Joanne Downey says she's seen scammers targeting the medical community with fake meds and substandard personal protective equipment. She's moving a bill through the assembly that would hit back harder. We want to make sure that no matter how many of the units or containers you sell, it's going to be a second degree crime. It's upgraded to a second degree crime. And that is punishable for up to five to 10 years in prison, 150,000 fine, or both. So we're serious and we wanna make sure that people know do not, do not try to do this because you will be punished. So scammers beware, lawmakers and law enforcement are onto you, but consumers and any of us who just wanna help also beware. If you're feeling pressure to share information or give up some cash, pause and go directly to the source. The Consumer Affairs Division of the AG's office has a hotline to report suspicious solicitations. The number is 866-720-5721. I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. Governor Murphy is weighing an unprecedented financial step to help New Jersey climb out of the economic hole caused by this pandemic. Rhonda Schaffler joins us with that and all the day's top business stories. Brianna, Governor Murphy says the fight against COVID-19 could leave the state with some serious cash flow shortages. He is now asking lawmakers to authorize the use of emergency borrowing powers as NJ Spotlight's John Reitmeyer says, the governor could be seeking to borrow as much as $9 billion. The idea that the state would issue bonds, you know, to pay the bills for what we don't know, an undefined uh, period right now, is certainly rare circumstances. And, and we'll see if lawmakers go along with this, because right now, uh, they're taking more of a wait and see approach. For more, check out John's article on njspotlight.com. An economic recovery task force has been organized by South Jersey's District 1 legislators. The task force will help businesses navigate any current challenges and also plan for an eventual reopening. Of course, the big question is when is that going to happen? State Senator Michael Testa says he is hoping that at least part of the summer tourism season can be saved. I don't think that we're going to be 100% back to normal, but we do need to be open to at least salvage some of the economy. Um, just to give you an idea, Cape May County sends $550 million in tourism tax dollars to Trenton each and every year. For small businesses in distressed communities, there is another option for financial help. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation is launching what's being called a Save Small Business Fund. The fund will provide grants of up to $5,000 for those businesses that qualify. Well, millions of Americans have received their checks from the IRS, millions more on the way. But this relief program has had its share of hiccups, according to several reports. Some people report checks have gone into the wrong bank accounts. There have been reports that checks have been sent to deceased people. And still others say they're having issues with the IRS tracking tool that is supposed to tell you when the check is on the way. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at stocks. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. 
practicing medicine has changed dramatically since the start of this outbreak. Telehealth is no longer an alternative option for patients, but the option for non-critical care. And experts say it's likely here to stay for good. Correspondent Michael Hill reports. Long before the coronavirus pandemic, some patients were visiting their doctors through technological advances in hookups. Social distancing is putting that method on steroids thanks to a ton of federal government rule changes, among them allowing doctors to use non-HIPAA approved platforms. But these days, uh, because of the waivers, we're allowed to use alternative methods of communication such as FaceTime, um, Zoom. Dr. Sean Lee of Premier Pain Centers said he rarely did virtual visits because of government regulations. The recent loosening of restrictions combined with the use of common social and business media platforms make it easy to do telemedicine. I get to spend a lot more time with them because of the, uh, the additional um, less constraints of, of waiting for somebody in the waiting room. Um, but there are some limitations. Obviously, I can't reach to the screen and touch them. But through this process, we've been learning how to deal with that. I've had patients stand up, show me how they walk, point to, them, to me where their pain is. I've even taught patients how to do certain exams. Dr. Lee says he's treating chronic pain in an opioid epidemic amid a viral pandemic, still paying attention to patients' body language and guarding against potential abuse by putting patients in three risk categories, low, medium, and high. High-risk patients. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm still in my office. If I see the need, we'll still bring them into the office, follow all the, the CDC guidelines in terms of screening and protecting my staff and the patient. But being, being able to, to do a urine drug screen, making sure they're taking their medications appropriately. Telemedicine does have limitations when patients need x-rays or stitches. In other urgent or even emergent cases, providers say telemedicine does work. American Family Care in Paramus says coronavirus cases account for 70 percent of its virtual visits. I think it's wonderful. I think it's very effective. It's, um, it allows, it's very like easy and simple for patients to have access to health care and it's very comfortable for patients. This new form of modern medicine offers a big assist and is allowing providers to monitor homebound patients' vitals. Dr. Lee says he's collecting data on his virtual visits because he wants regulators to know the benefits to permanently permit telemedicine long after the end of the pandemic. I'm hoping that I can incorporate this into my practice. Michael Hill, NJTV News. For years, people in Patterson have turned to the nonprofit Oasis to fill educational gaps for kids and help lift women out of poverty. But the coronavirus forced the group to shut down its core operation and reinvent itself as a food distribution site to keep the community fed during these hard times. Tonight, we continue our series, Hunger in New Jersey, focusing on food insecurity and the search for solutions to help write an end to this story. Raven Santana reports. I just don't like them to suffer. It's going to be hard. Nina Defensa says trying to feed her two sons and eight grandkids who are all now living with her has become nearly impossible. Struggling to cook the food because you're always missing something. But everything is prepared, then you don't have to worry. You could, by cooking your food, you still got to use your gas, your electric. This is one thing that's easing at least a little. To make it work, Defensa wakes up early every morning and walks down to Mill Street here in Patterson and gathers as much food as her walker can hold. The food that you get here, how much, how long does it last you? A couple of days. How many times are you coming here? Well, right now I'm coming every day to get the meals. Under normal times, OASIS is an anti-poverty and educational program for women and families. But on March 17th, the executive director says that all changed. We had a man come to our door and he said, I have no food for myself and my son. And we looked at each other and we said, this is, this are extraordinary circumstances, so we will serve men as well. Um, when we told that man we would give him food, he broke down crying. The organization says it's given out 10 times more meals than any other time and says 50% of the people who have come here in the last month since the COVID-19 outbreak are brand new, including Francis Harrison. In some baby items, it's four children and two adults in the household. 
Patterson resident Francis Harrison is picking up items for a friend in need who found out about Oasis through social media. Yes, they will need Oasis. It's easy to walk here if you live in this community. You know, at a certain point in the day, can you describe what the line looks like? We have two separate lines, one for a woman in the front and one for a man. They go both to both blocks, to both blocks. A lot of people come. We're monitoring the lines and we're making sure everyone's spread out and peaceful and whatnot. And in addition to food, the organization is also helping families remain safe and healthy by giving them bandanas, rubber bands, and instructions on how to make a mask. And we handed out dish towels with Easter bunnies on them. And the next day, some of our families came back with dish towels tied around their faces. And one of our donors heard about it and she ordered 1,200 bandanas. While grateful for the more than $200,000 in recent donations, the executive director says she is now worried about how much longer the nonprofit will be able to meet the new demands for food brought on by this pandemic. In Patterson, Raven Santana, and JTV News. Funding for Hunger in New Jersey has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health that provides everyone in America a fair and just opportunity for health and well being. Before we leave you tonight, precious cargo arriving not a moment too soon. A shipment of 50,000 and 95 masks for healthcare workers in the area arrived on a United Airlines flight at Newark Airport Thursday evening. The masks were imported from China earlier this week through the nonprofit group MedShare. The group says the supply may be far short of demand, but it's a start. And that does it for us tonight. We'll continue to keep you updated all weekend long with all the latest information at njtvnews.org. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire team. Thanks for being here. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.